Hello and welcome to the Fighting Spirit Podcast. As always, I'm Jason and I'm here to bring you the five picks for UFC Fight Night taking place in Raleigh, North Carolina, where Curtis Razorblades will be taking on JDS or Junior Dos Santos in what will be an amazing heavyweight bout. We get some other ones that are looking really good as well, including the co-main event where Rafael Dos Anjos will be taking on Michael Chiesa. I'm excited for a few good ones on this card. Let's get into it. Here's the show. All right, so we're going to kick things off with the main event where Curtis Razorblades is going to be taking on Junior Dos Santos. And I'm going to cut right to the chase for this main event. I think that Curtis Blades gets it done. So everybody that Curtis Blades has basically fought, with the exception of Francis Ngannou. In fact, you know what? It's only Francis Ngannou. They've fought twice. I forgot to go further down the list here. He lost Ngannou in 2018. He lost to him in 2016. That is Curtis Blades' Achilles heel, if you will. And I think that he will have no problem going like a buzzsaw, basically, through anybody else, at least at this level of the game. As you get to the very top of the heavyweight division, things do kind of get a little murky for Razor Blades. However, JDS, you know, very competent fighter, and I don't mean to make it sound like he's not one of the top heavyweights out there, but at 35 years of age and his kind of record where he's at right now, kind of losing basically to the best, uh, Francis Ngannou, Stevie Amiotis, and Alistair Overeem in his most recent losses, I don't think he can fight the best anymore, and I think that guys like Derek Lewis, Blagoy Ivanov, and Ty Tuivasa, where his last three wins, are the caliber of fighter that he can beat, so really guys that are getting to the top level, or you know, guys that are on a hot streak coming up, I can see the JDS taking them out, and you know, snuffing out their fire but he's having trouble with these top, top guys. You know, he's a very well-balanced fighter, but he doesn't have tremendous power in this category anymore. He doesn't have tremendous wrestling in this category anymore when he has his tremendous experience. But I don't think it's going to be enough to overcome, overcome Razor Blades here. Uh, Blades is just an amazing takedown artist. He nails takedowns like nobody really else in the heavyweight division. His average is phenomenal. He's scoring around seven takedowns per 15 minutes, so he's basically getting about seven takedowns in an entire fight if it does go the distance. Those are some very, very heavy takedown numbers, and we know that JDS's takedown defense is pretty decent at 80%, but I don't think he's going to be able to stop Curtis Blades. And speaking of stoppages, I don't think he's going to be able to stop the takedowns. I also don't think he's going to be able to stop Blades himself with power. Dos Santos does have very good boxing, but he doesn't have that straight-up knock-you-out power like guys like Nganu has. He has to pour it on in a little more volume, which is kind of rare for the heavyweight division, and I think that's going to present a challenge when you're fighting off your back, which is exactly where Curtis Blades is going to want to put you. I can see JDS maybe every time the round starts putting on a nice display of his boxing however blades is going to drive in close the distance and he's going to score those takedowns also blades does have a three inch reach advantage so he can stay outside of junior dos santos when he needs to and come in shorten the gap put him on the cage and put him down on the mat i think that curtis razor blades picks up a very good win here and so he's our pick in fight night. All right, so this next one taking place at welterweight is probably my favorite fight of the evening, and that's going to be Rafael Dos Anjos taking on Michael Chiesa. And so this one is going to be very, very interesting. I'm not sure who you think I'm going to pick. If you're going with experience, you know, you got to go with RDA, but if you're going with the ability to choke a man out, which is exactly how I think this is going to play out, you got to go with Michael Chiesa. I think that Chiesa's ability to score not really so much takedowns, but score top game or take your back or do whatever is necessary on the mat to get to the rear naked choke uh, position. I think that Michael Chiesa is going to be able to do that. Rafael Dos Anjos is no slouch with a black belt and BJJ himself, but I think that he's going to run into trouble with Chiesa. I think Chiesa is going to be able to put this on the mat by keeping Dos Anjos on the back foot. If you do come forward on Dos Anjos, he's not a good rear heel fighter, and I think that he will find himself in a world of hurt as Chiesa grabs a double leg, grabs a single leg, with him pushed up against the cage, and put it on the mat. Also, we know that RDA is coming off of a, quite a few losses, right? He lost to Leon Edwards, he did defeat Kevin Lee, but then had two losses uh, before that, Usman and Covington. He's basically three 
uh, for four in his losses, and I don't think he's going to be able to turn it around so much and pick up another W here. Whereas we look over at Chiesa, he beat some great legends so far in the game. Carlos Condit, Diego Sanchez, he'd love to add RDA to that legend hit list and pick up a W at welterweight here. I think he's turning himself around. He was choked out by Pettis and he was, yeah, he was choked up by Pettis and Kevin Lee in their last two contests, but I think he's learned from that. I think he's developed and I think that he's going to be able to submit RDA. So we are picking Michael Chiesa in this welterweight matchup. In our next contest, we're going to have one at men's flyweight. So get ready for a good 15 minutes of excitement because we're going to have Jordan Espinosa taking on Alex Perez. And so this one is kind of an interesting fight, but I ultimately think that it's going to go to Perez because of his striking output and his ability to put a man down if necessary at flyweight at least. I mean, we're talking about low levels of power, but when I look at Perez, he does have what seems to be the more competent hands here, and I think that he's going to be able to put a little bit of work on Espinosa. However, if Espinosa does close the distance, can manage to get this to the mat, I think that he is going to be able to potentially score some takedowns, score at least some submission attempts against S- uh, against Perez, and I think that that could be Perez's undoing. But Perez is just a little bit better on the feet, a little bit better striking output, a little bit better defense, and just to back it up, I think that even though Espinosa stands the bigger uh, trouble on the ground. I think the Perez's takedown percentage is this that much higher, where if he really wants to get it to the mat, I think that he could. It's just, I think the most ideal situation for Perez is to keep it standing, where I think he has the greatest advantage. So I am picking Alex Perez in this contest. All right, and our next one at Lady Strawweight, don't burn me, please. Angela Hill, uh, that's how I'm calling her, <laughs> over Kill Hill, taking on Hannah Seifers, the shockwave. And so in this one, I'm picking against Angela Hill, as I'm apt to do, because the numbers just don't shake out that well for this fighter. However, I've been burned by Hill before, and I want to throw that out there to everyone. She defeated Ar- Ariane Carnalosi and defeated Jody Escobel, two fighters that I definitely picked against her. And I think at the time I did pick her against Jin Yang, uh, she ended up picking up a hit loss. So she keeps burning me back and forth. And, you know, even though she is burning me, I don't think she's going to win this fight. I think the numbers are still going to air on the side of Seifers. I think she's going to be able to get a win. Now, speaking of those wins, she's on a two-fight winning streak, one split decision, one unanimous decision. And both of these fighters, I think, have very similar skill sets. They're both mostly knockout artists. Um, but I think that Seifers, being 27 years of age, looking like she has faster better hands, a bit more power than Hill is going to be able to get it done here. Hill is 35. She's definitely the end of her ladies' career. You know, the, even the highest end fighters like Holly Holm have declined as they've reached this age. And I think that instead of overkill Hill, it's just over Hill because she is over the Hill and she's not going to be able to get it done here. Bear in mind, like I said earlier, I have been burned by this woman before. She does have a phenomenal camp in Alliance MMA where the likes of Dominic Cruz train. So she definitely has a good camp behind her. But, you know, at her 10-7 and 7 record, what I've seen her do in the UFC, most of it looks like she's fighting for a paycheck. I don't see her climbing the ladder. However, I do see Hannah Seifers potentially trying to make a statement in the Lady Strawweight division. So I do think that this 115-pound fight is going to go to Seifers, and we are picking the shockwave in this matchup. All right, so our next one here is going to be a debuting bout for Jamal Hill, Sweet Dreams. He's going to be taking on Darko Stoisic. So Stoisic we've seen in the UFC. He's looked okay. He hasn't had a win since his entry into the UFC, getting a first-round TKO. We all thought, hey, man, this guy's the real deal. And he struggled against uh, Devin Clark and Kennedy Najaku. So I I honestly think that he's on the decline here. He really needs a win, but I don't think he's going to get it. I think Jamal Hill looks phenomenal for his young 28 years of age coming into the UFC through the Dana White Contender Series. He looks like uh, you know, how Stoisic looked coming in. He was hungry. He was ready. But I think that he's ready to prove it more so than Stoisic. And I think he goes to 7-0 and here. Stoisic, you know, you might think he has a lot of experience. But he's only 13-3. and You know, I don't think that uh, he has fought at the highest level for very long. And I think that Jamal Hill, a hungry young fighter, is going to be able to get it done here. 
Also, I just want to throw out there that I probably am a little dumb if you look at their ages because Stoicic is 27 and younger than Hill. But nevertheless, I'm still siding with Hill here. Uh, even though my narrative is a little bit blown out, I'm sticking with Sweet Dreams. I think he's the better fighter here. I like his hot hands, and I think he's going to be more apt to shut the door. We haven't seen Stoicic looking so hot lately, and I think he's going to be able to catch Stoicic on the downhill. I am picking Sweet Dreams Jamal Hill in this matchup. In our next matchup taking place at middleweight, we are going to have experience versus fire in the belly because we're going to have Bevin, the extraordinary gentleman, I like the fight name by the way, taking on Daquan Townsend, the tarantula. So the tarantula Townsend, he's 21 and 9, Lewis 6 and 2. Now one small edge I want to throw out here for Lewis, he trains at one of the best in the biz, he is a Jackson Wink MMA guy, Townsend trains at a place called the Murcielago MMA. I'm not very familiar with it. I don't believe there's any champions coming out of there at this point. No offense to them. Everything takes time. But I got to go with a proven product in Jackson Wink here. And I think that's a big edge here for Bevan Lewis. But Bevan Lewis, you know, he has looked a little bit sloppy coming in. He had, you know, really some tall orders coming into the UFC. He looked like a real hot product. And so he got, I think, talent above his level. He had to take on Uriah Hall and the dentist Darren Stewart. Those are two fights that I would not personally want to take as a very green fighter. I think they threw a lot at Lewis very early on. I'm hoping his confidence isn't rocked and then he's going to be able to bounce back against Townsend. Now, with that being said, Townsend, you know, he is coming off a loss himself, but he looked pretty good into the UFC, so he's also going to be desperate to get a win, you know, to kind of set the record straight and make a statement in here, but I think that Bevan Lewis just has the bigger talent pool behind him, I think he has the better training, and I think up until he fought some really, really good talent, he was just, you know, unstoppable. Nothing against Taquan Townsend, but he's not Uriah Hall, and he's not Darren Stewart, and I don't think he gets it done here. We are going with Bevan Lewis in this matchup. In another fight of experience versus, you know, fire in the belly, hunger and desire, we have Arnold Almighty Allen taking on Nick the Carney Lentz. And so Nick Lentz, you know, real legend of the game at this point. He's 30 and 10, 35 years of age, trains over Hard Knocks 365. Most of the time, I would say that this guy can get it done. He's beaten legends like Scott Holtzman, Gray Maynard, but he's lost to, you know, a lot of other guys, up and comers, Islam Makachev, David Taymor, and Charles Dobronx Olvera. Not that Dobronx is really still an up and comer, but he's taken some losses recently. When I look over on Arnold Allen, though, he's a tri star product. When I talked earlier about Jackson Wink, this is another one, one of the best in the biz at Faraz Hobby, right? So we have Arnold Allen training at TriStar, looking amazing. He has not taken a loss in the UFC once. He's on a one, two, three, four, five, six fight winning streak in the UFC. Gilbert Burns, Jordan Rinaldi, Mads Burnell, Marquan Armacani, uh, Yatsen Meza, Alan O'Mear, and Paul Cook. Actually, Paul Cook was before he got into the UFC. This guy has not lost a fight since 2014, and I think he's going to buzzsaw and steamroll Nick Lentz. Nothing against Lentz, but I think that this younger talent pool, especially at 140, pounds where this fight is going to be taking place is going to be just too deep a water for Lentz to hang and I think that his career honestly at this point is on the decline and I think Allen is going to be able to make him pay for that decline by picking up a victory here just bear in mind though he does a lot of times take it to decision he doesn't always shut the door but when he does he has a balance of knockouts and decisions uh, sorry knockouts and submissions uh, but I do think this could ultimately go to a decision at the end of the day Either way, we are picking the English fighter training at TriStar, Arnold Almighty Allen. In our next matchup at Ladies Flyway, we're going to have Justine Kish take on Lucy the Bullet Pudilova. So in this one, it is a tough call to make on either fighter. Uh, we have Kish with a two-fight losing streak, not a win since 2016. And we have a similar story for Pudilova, who hasn't had a win since 2018, with three you know, very close-together consecutive losses. Irene Aldana, Liz Carmuz, and Antonia Shevchenko, Valentina's sister. So I ultimately here you know, want to say Pudilova will win. We've seen her fight some really good talent in Aldana and Carmouche and just come up short. The fight with Aldana was a split. Uh, obviously, we had a full unanimous decision against Carmouche, and then she was choked out by Antonia Shevchenko. But I think that she's really only losing to the best, not that Antonia is is the best, but you just train with her sister who is the best, right? So I am picking Pudilova here, 
But, you know, this is a grain of salt moment here. We have a really good camp in Black House that is training Kish. uh, And, you know, she is 31 years of age. She has a little more experience under her uh, under her belt, just from an age perspective, Pudalova is 25. Even though she has more fights, you know, just life experience, only the age of 25. You know, I'm not uh, too crazy about this call here. Um, it's just a really hard one to make a decision on. And even though I feel the numbers do lie with Pudalova being the better fighter, because of her three or fight losing streak, I'm not sure she has, you know, the actual talent under the hood to put all of it together. So we'll see how it ends up playing out. But I am cautiously picking Lucy the Bullet Pudalova to pick up a W in Raleigh. In our next contest, we are going to have Montel Quick Jackson take on Felipe Dias Colrales in what should be a very, very good bantam weight matchup. So I like Montel Jackson in this one. I think he's looking phenomenal. He did run into a little bit of a wall when he fought Ricky Simone, but he beat Brian Kelleher, who got a win just this past weekend, and Andre Sukumtot who's always a gamer and throws down very well, and he was able to get a decision in that one. I like Montel. I think that he is a very good fighter, and I think he's going to be able to dig it out here. He's 8-1 and one going up against a fighter who's 9-1, and one, so we're looking at guys that are very, very similar. On the one hand, we have Cole Rallis. Uh, with the five submissions and two knockouts. We have Jax with the five KOs and one submission. So I think we're going to look at a ground fighter versus a striker. And I think that Jackson has the slight edge here. I like his hands. He also does have a, a, uh, a submission against Kelleher. So I think he can get it done anywhere and just do it a little bit better than Felipe can do it. So I'm picking Montel Quick Jackson in this matchup. All right, in our next one here, it might be her last fight ever. We have 39-year-old Sarah McMahon, a legend of the game, taking on Lena Landsberg, the elbow queen. So this one is going to be a really interesting fight. And I say McMahon's a legend because she did fight the likes of Ronda Rousey, Misha Tate, and Amanda Nunes. Now, she took losses in all of those fights, but she beat some other amazing talents like Jessica I and Alexis Davis. She is a legend of the sport. I'm surprised she's only 11 and 5. I would have expected her to have a few more fights, but I think that she's going to be able to go out and pick up a win. I don't know if this is going to be to close out her career, but I think she's going to be able to do it. Whereas Lena Landsberg, you know, she did have an amazing win over Macy Kiesen. I did not see it coming. Um, I thought that Kiesen was going to go right through her, but Kiesen, um, you know, just did not have what it takes uh, and was not have a did not have a high enough fight IQ to outdo the experienced elbow queen. In this one, McMahon IQ is not a problem. She's fought the best in the business at the highest of levels, and I think as long as her skill set is still there, granted we haven't seen her in over a year, right? Uh, she last fought in February 24th, 2018, so actually almost going on two years. So Sarah McMahon, I think if she's still the talented individual that she was, I think she gets it done and takes out Lena Landsberg. We are picking Sarah McMahon in this contest. All right, and then the last two here, we're going to have two debuting fights, so not too much to say about them. But we have Brett Johns taking on Tony Gravely. And in this one, I do like Johns. He is not the debuting fighter in this one. He's a great Welsh fighting product, and I think that he is going to pick up a win, even though he has taken two bad losses. Granted, he lost to the best in the biz, Pedro Munoz and Aljamain Sterling. Those are two guys at the top of men's bantamweight that you do not want to mess with. And then the next one, we have Herbert Burns taking on Nate Landwehr, I believe is how you pronounce his name. And both of these guys are coming in. One of them from the Titan FC promotion, getting a win on the Dana White Contender Series, and the other one from M1. So I am going with Nate Landwehr here because he's coming out of that M1 promotion. M1 in Russia is very high-level stuff. Now, let's not take away too much here from Herbert because he did once fight at 1FC, but he bounced around there. I don't know what happened there, but he fought a little bit at 1FC, then he went to one championship, then the Titan. I'm not sure where kind of that gap ended up coming in where he had to go on the you know U.S. regional scene at Titan FC. I'm not sure what happened there, but Nate looks like a proven product out of the M1 promotion, and I think he gets it done. Eight KOs over 13 wins. I think he wants to make a statement in the UFC and pick up a knockout upon his entry and go like a buzzsaw as fast as he can at featherweight if he can get it done. We are picking Nate Landwehr in his debut. All right, so let's go over them one more time. We have Blades, Chiesa, Perez, Seifers, Lewis, Allen, Pudalova, Jackson, McMahon, Hill, Johns, and Landwehr 
to round things out. So that takes us on to housekeeping. If you'd like to get in touch with the Fighting Spirit Podcast, get in touch with us at fightingspiritpodcast at gmail.com. You also can get in touch with us on Facebook, YouTube, or anything that you like. I look forward to hearing from you, and please spread into the show if you've listened up to this point. All right, so uh, just kind of general state of the show. We just released a liquor review, so if you haven't seen that, please check it out. It's going to be Red Breast Single Pot Still Irish Whiskey. Very good stuff, very good review. I highly suggest you go out and listen to that one. Uh, otherwise, you know, we'll be coming back with a retrospective for this one on probably Sunday morning, you know, time willing. And uh, yeah, so I'll be back soon. And until I speak with you, happy fight picking. <laughs>